Hello, everybody, and welcome to the very first ever episode 10 of the Crossplay Podcast. I am Nikki James, sitting here alongside Zach. What's up, Crossplayers? Dude, we made it. 10 episodes in. 10 deep. We can quit now. We all right. <clears throat> so thank you all for joining us on the very last... I'm just kidding. No, there is going to be <laughs> many, many more Crossplay Podcasts to go. We will be sitting here, I think, one day, Zach, on even episode 100 or 500. You never know. You never know. 500 weeks is like 10 years or something <laughs> like that. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's a lot. I, I might change my mind on that. <laughs> um, I've been uh, playing a lot of Rainbow Six this week. They released new DLC, new operators, new map, et cetera, et cetera. Blood Orchid. Um, Rainbow Six is pretty much my number one game. So it's anytime they release new operators, it's exciting. And last season, they kind of gypped us of an operator. We were supposed to get two. We got none. So it's... You know, we're kind of starved for new content. So it was really cool. Uh, it's feed in time. All the noobs are back on. So yes. everyone that knows what they're doing is just having a really fun time. Um, yeah. Have, have you been playing anything this week? Yeah. Well, I played that with you a yeah. little bit, and I can attest it's definitely feeding time for the veterans. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the stupidest moves I've seen this last week on, on Rainbow Six. Um, so I played a little bit of that, um, a little bit of UFC. Last night, I beat Binding of Isaac again. Um, first try first try very first try um so it's kind of the same old games with me uh this week uh madden 18 i've been playing that if you if you watch our youtube channel you know we have a a a video series of us playing the story mode which is actually really good it's i'm super impressed you know for where we've come from you know john madden 95 on the sega to where we are now where we're getting full uh 10 hour cinematic experiences it's it's pretty awesome it's one of the best if not the best madden uh i guess story mode <laughs> that's kind of weird it to is say. yeah because all their other story modes were okay you're in for this one play in the football game and try to make a sack and then boom it's it's the next week already right. it's, it's always ha- lacked any sort of real story outside of you just trying to make it in the nf in the nfl Right. What else have you been playing? Um, I'll always play UFC. So I've been knocking out noobs on, on UFC. UFC 2 last night. Me and you actually had a pretty good run. We sure as shit did. <laughs> Stipe. We uh, fucked up Tyson. If you want to know what it's like, what would happen if Tyson fought Stipe in the ring today? He would get his ass kicked according to the UFC 2 game. Yeah, and all it is is a matter of uh, using your reach advantage. You yeah. Know? When when Tyson comes at us hot with those body you know hooks and uppercuts, you just start jabbing him away and he can't keep up. We no, nope. <laughs> he gets tired. We embarrassed that poor kid <laughs> that was Mike Tyson. It's funny. There, no one looks stupider than when they're getting jabbed in the face when they're trying to throw like a big power hook. Yeah, or <laughs> when they're, they're trying like, to clinch on you. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, the clinching is so annoying in that game. We got to do another um, let's play of, of we, UFC. We will, and in fact, uh, coming up. Uh, probably towards the end of next week, we have three more UFC 2 episodes coming out on YouTube. Excellent. That still haven't been released. So look out for those. And if you uh, want to, you can follow us over on Twitter at CrossplayPod. And you could also check us out over on Patreon at patreon.com slash crossplayentertainment. And read the blog over at crossplayentertainment.wordpress.com. We could have played UFC all night. And Binding of Isaac. Because yeah. you know how it gets playing Binding of Isaac. You can get easily... Very easily sucked in. Yeah. And that's actually kind of a nice segue into our topic of the show, uh, which this is your topic. Uh, can a game be too addictive? Is there is there a point where a game is so addictive that it's uh, a detrimental to, to your daily life or just to your enjoyment of the game even? Absolutely. Let me tell you firsthand, I'm the most addictive gamer that you know. Um, Binding of Isaac really toes the line with being too addictive, but I'm able to I'm able to shut it off after a couple runs. Um, so it's not that bad. But let's rattle off before we get too deep into the weeds here. Let's rattle off some addicting games. Like okay. I know you go. We'll stick turns. Tropico Five. Fuck yeah, Tropico Five. Oh my god. Uh, recently, I found out Trials Fusion. Played that for seven hours last Sunday. Uh, in the blink of an eye, came and went. Uh, what else? Civilization four or yeah, five? Any Civ game? Any really. Civ game? It's it's one of those addicting uh, that that addicting way of one more try, one more turn. 
Give me one more turn. And then I'll go to bed. And yeah. the next thing you know, you're on turn 1100. Yep. Oh, wait, they're amassing an army at my border. Well, let me handle that first. not going to go to bed without happening. Yeah. <laughs> I won't be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> <laughs> not with the Mongolians lining up on my southern wall. <laughs> Uh, what else? Super Meat Boy. That that one more Ooh, try mentality. Yeah. That's addictive. I, not yes. not on the level though as Tropical Five, where it's dangerous. You know, yeah, Tropical Five will ruin your life. You hear that? People do not play that game. Don't play Tropical Five. I'm I'm with you on that. Me and Zach both got sucked into the tropical hole, and uh, we've lost days. It got to the point where I started downloading their soundtrack and listening it to listening to it in my car. <laughs> it just completely consumed every square foot of my brain. Having dreams about rebel uprisings. <laughs> uh, so, Tropical Five is a really great example. Let's let's use that as our launching point. Is it addicting to the point where it's not fun or it's not a good thing? And what is that? And what does it feel like? And why is that? It's so it's addictive to the point where you binge on it for a long time, but it it eventually you come to a point where you're like, I, I can never play this game again. That's that's where I was. I mean, I, I put in so many hours in that game, and it got to a point where I just completely swore it off. And I haven't played it in a couple of years now, maybe. Um, and it's because it's cause you can't. Uh, you know, I, I have a distinct memory, and I probably, I'll probably i probably never forget this. It's one of my most outstanding gaming memories of playing that one night. I think you were here. I think you may have even wanted to hang out, and I was like, I'm, I'm tropical in right now. And I ended up playing maybe 12 hours and it got to the point where I literally there was a physical pain and like a physical like something in me w- would not hit the dashboard button so I can get out of that game and I remember having to force myself literally force myself like it was a fucking drug to hit the dashboard button put down the controller <laughs> and put down the controller and once I did that I was free like I just and I don't think I've yeah. played since that day actually yeah the shackles came off holy smokes so I've been I've had to do that. I've done that I've done that with binding of excuse me, I've done that with binding of Isaac too. But um the thing is I go back to that game. Tropico five, you know, I've I've been there where it's I have to force myself where it's not really it's not really a, a decision I want to make or I can make. I just I need to make it, otherwise I'm gonna ruin my life. Yeah, yeah. It's uh it's I don't know. I wonder if it's something developers think about or something they consider or maybe it's something they want. You know, because maybe not everyone is like us and can eventually hop off. I think there are a lot of people that can. Um, and, I mean, there's aspects of the game that are cool. I mean, the reason why I, I can never put it down is time is constantly running. There's always, uh, you know, it's always mo- uh, running in the background. You're constantly having to build shit. There's shit always getting built. Um so I mean, you you always have a plan in mind where, when you're uh, building a city. You have an idea of okay, I'm gonna have my commercial sh- stuff over here. I'll have uh, my neighborhoods this in in this area. All the poor people inland and all the poor people inland. Um, so I mean, it's it's one of those games where you have a vision for what you want it to turn out, and you can't really ever stop until you fulfill that vision. But it constantly changes because there's always new shit coming out. And, yeah, there's... And, and you know what a part of that is in, in game development uh, is no natural stopping points. That's kind of when, when people will tend to leave the game is after a match of Rainbow Six, after you beat Binding of Isaac. You know what I mean? But what Tropico, another great example that I'm very experienced with is Minecraft. Oh. It's the same thing. There's no stopping point where they're like, all right, you're done now. Uh, load the next level. So there's no, yeah. there's nothing like that. So when I back in 2012, I got really into Minecraft, and I didn't play the adventure mode. I didn't do any of that. All it was just Legos for me, just building cool shit. And I got friends along, and we one day we just started digging a hole, and we're like, let's see where this goes. We dug a hole that was, you know, how big a Minecraft block is. Yeah. So it was probably like. About a, the size of a football field, sunken in about a hundred blocks deep, all the way as the, the as far as the level would allow us to go down to bedrock, and then we're like, now that we got this huge hole, which we just dug with shovels after like twelve hours, we're like, what do we do with it? We we're like, let's build a city in here. We'll call it Crater City. Oh, awesome! And it's gonna have like it's gonna everything's gonna be built into the walls, and there's gonna be a big atrium in the middle. And me and this this uh, old friend of mine, Andrew, spent a week just day in day out nonstop building crater city and it's just it was so fun man it was so memorable like and i really didn't feel that that way with minecraft where it got to a point of detriment but 
uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that if there's no natural stopping points, it really increases the chance that you're going to just keep playing and keep playing yeah. and keep playing. Keep digging. You know, before we move on to the next topic, I wanted to touch on a couple things. Not really news, just just notes, interesting things. Uh, L.A. Noire is getting a re-release on the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and most importantly, or most interestingly, the Nintendo Switch. Um, did you play much of L.A. Noire? Yeah, I did. I actually really, really liked the game. How far did you get? Uh, didn't solve the main story. I didn't beat the game. Long game. It was a long game, and eventually I lost interest. I was I was renting that game actually. So, do you play it on PS3? Uh, PS3, yeah, yeah. I don't think it's out on PS4. I think that's what this whole story is about. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I played it. It was on the 360. It was three discs on the 360. That's how big it was. Whoa! It was one disc on PS3. It, it was, was, yeah. Okay. Those Blu-ray discs. Yeah. Blu-ray. Um. So I played it uh, through and through to the end. I was engrossed by it. it had a great uh, noir-style detective story. Uh, a cool ending. Uh, spoiler alert for this like seven-year-old game it ends up the killer was him all along um uh, oh. and that during the his time in the military which they constantly flash back to in the game he yeah. kind of went crazy and developed a psychosis and so it was him all along that was this killer in la uh and it, it, wow. it was just a cool uh, uh noir style twist at the end and i really enjoyed it so it's really rad that it's coming out uh for newer consoles it's uh underappreciated i feel like i feel like not enough people played it. it the production on that game i don't know if you knew this it was developed by team bondi which was an australian company they bankrupted bankrupted themselves making this game did you know that no but i'm not surprised considering how the video game industry fares down in australia yeah it's just like everything else in australia it's it's dangerous very dangerous. <laughs> but yeah, they put so much money into the facial technology, the face scanning and all that, that they just bankrupted themselves. And so shortly after the game came out, even though it was successful, they crumbled. Wow. Uh, so that's that. Second bit of, I guess you'd say, news. South Park, the fractured butthole, uh, being released, I believe, next year. I don't have a release date on hand. But have you heard that the difficulty slider on that game uh, dictates your skin color? No, that is uh, yeah. that is edgy to say the least. It is edgy. It's not uh, surprising coming from South Park. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're, it's not like them. They're they're usually pretty conservative. No, yeah. As the the game goes on and you make it uh, your difficulty harder and harder, your skin gets darker and darker. <laughs> it's kind of like making it in America. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, it, that's the thing is like you can't even really be offended because it's a pretty accurate social commentary at the same time as, yeah. as South Park tends to do. Right. Uh, so that's it. Just those two bits before we get into the next topic. And the next topic being, uh, Zach, how do you deal with the troublesome coworker? Now, let me preface this a bit. Let okay. me tell you the, the problems with my troublesome coworker. And in fact, I don't think I've told you this yet. Okay. I've, I've waited, held on to this story for the podcast. So I work at a what's called an FBO, which is basically a fancy word for a gas station for airplanes, right? So, yeah. So jets come in and get gas. They sometimes stay in our hangar. So part of that job is getting fuel loads, uh, you know, from transport trucks. And every time we get one of those, we got to do the simple checklist saying that we, you know, verified the type of fuel it is, you know, normal quality standard type stuff. So before I continue, there's a guy at my work named Jerry. Okay. Okay. This, this Jerry fellow, he's a really cool kid when he's not at work. <laughs> he's very nice. Uh, however, he's got that go-getter attitude where like if you're like hey jerry will you go grab that on the other side of the tarmac he will sprint full speed almost like into a naruto run with his arms <laughs> behind his back to go get it because he's a little go-getter and he wants right. to make himself look good however the problem lies in that he has a really bad habit of trying to make himself look good while simultaneously making others look bad so he would start writing emails to the to our company here and to our corporate headquarters down in burbank over really silly stuff like someone not throwing out the trash or the front desk was a little dirty when he came in today. So he would use language like, I'm very displeased today. And it's like, dude, you're 22 and you've been working here three months. I've been here five years. Like, I don't, yeah. need, I don't need you preaching to me, little kid. You know what it I mean? It shows, yeah. Then. <laughs> and, and I don't mind being corrected. You know, I don't mind, you know, anyone telling me that I missed something in my, in my job. But when you're, like, intentionally writing emails to make yourself look good and others look bad and intentionally including corporate hoping they'll see it it's really underhanded you know yeah uh, it's and it's a transparent attempt to try to further yourself by by lowering others you yes know? 
So what happened was when I noticed this, I didn't, I wasn't rude to him. I didn't clap back at him in any way in emails. I just pulled him aside man to man. And I was like, Hey, I just want to let you know, you know, for me, if there's a, ever a problem with how we're working, uh, it's best just to talk to me, pull me aside and be like, Hey, I noticed you missed this. I noticed you might've missed that. Uh, these emails can be pretty, uh, underhanded and they can seem really passive aggressive. Mm-hmm. And we had a good talk and he agreed. Okay. So right to my face. <laughs> and then the next day he goes on and continues doing this stuff. Okay. Okay. So we start to have a problem, right? Yeah. So back to this fuel checklist thing. The other day I have a picture to show you also, Zach, I'll put it up on the, on the YouTube video. So on this checklist, I just, you know, went down the list doing, saying that I, uh, checked all the quality and he comes behind me, takes it out of my boss's box. He r- writes an S for satisfactory over all of my check marks. And then at the bottom writes fixed by JG, his initials. What? Yeah. Like how, how like underhanded is that? Like, how do you even handle that? Here, look, look at this picture, Zach. <clears throat> so it's little things like that that are showing that he's just clearly trying to like undermine his fellow coworkers, trying to make himself look good. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, someone like that. It's, how do you? How would you handle this? Someone as young as that that's so inexperienced. He's making so many career mistakes. I mean, borderline career suicide. He absolutely has no future in this company. I can tell you that right now. Right. When someone does something, when they try to make you look bad and make themselves look good, it's not only transparent to you, but it's transparent to corporate on these emails that he's sending to them. It's transparent right. to your boss. People aren't stupid. People people recognize this. They've played office politics. They know how it works. Yeah. And he's making himself look like a horrible coworker. He's if if you saw someone like that, if you were in a position to promote someone and you saw this guy who makes the people around him look bad in order to make himself look good, you wouldn't want him in a position of leadership because he you know, he's he's not a team player. Um if I were in your position, I would just sit back and watch it burn because Slow tie his own rope. He's yeah. He's really he's making so many mistakes as a youngster. He's ruining his relationship with his coworker, with his peer, and at simultaneously making himself look like a bad employee to corporate. Right. So, and, and you know, corporate doesn't want to be bothered with somebody not taking out the trash. Exactly. That is so beneath them. Yeah. Do you think they fucking think about that ever? Yeah. That is the least of their concerns. They have much more important emails in their inbox. Exactly. And so this kid is just an idiot. So if I were in that situation, I would just sit back and and let him do do the damage to himself. So it's kind of like what you're saying is the, the correct approach is to outsmart somebody that's trying to pull shit like that. Um, you could, I mean, I guess in a way you're already out, you're already out, outsmarting him because he's, uh, he's acting like a complete fool. He's acting like he's never had a job before or like he's never been part of a team before. Yeah. So, um, that's not how you move up in leadership and it's not, it's not how you look good. It's how you look bad. So, um, so to others that might be listening, that might be having, problems with coworkers. Uh I would say, you know, the best way is to keep your uh superiors apprised on everything. Mm-hmm. That way if there's ever something real that happens, they're they're up to date. And and they will probably like the uh transparency. Yeah. You know? Um don't directly attack or, or uh further things if you don't have to because it's not worth your job. And exactly. and try to outsmart them. Yep. You know what I mean? I think that might be just play your cards close to your chest and and you know corporate you want them to know nothing you don't they this they cannot know about this really right. you don't want them to right but your immediate boss uh, should be aware of of what's going on and it 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 wouldn't hurt you to have a conversation with them and be like look how how bad this looks he's emailing corporate as well it's making our whole fbo look bad it's it's reflecting right. negatively on our entire fbo well, I think that's what I'm going to do. Maybe next week I'll have a sit down with me and him and, and the old boss and just hammer it out because it's really not worth having a hostile work environment is never fun for anybody. You know? Yeah. So thanks for the advice. That's some really good advice. Moving on. 
down the list now to the very next topic is the forgotten game of the week. This week's game is Freedom Fighters. Did you ever play this game? I never played it. I What console was this on? It was on the GameCube, and I, it might have even uh, been on the PS2. Uh, but it was a third party, third person shooter uh, where you're fighting commies in New York, basically. So I did awesome. a little, I did a little write up. So I'm gonna get right into it now. Freedom Fighters. Every now and then, every development team on Earth will become obsessed by a new gameplay mechanic. They crowd around it, make a bunch of noise before dashing back to their design coops to create their vision. So in the early 2000s, the obsession was uh, this rudimentary, rudimentary AI squad control. Every game had it whether they needed it, like uh, Brothers in Arms, SWAT 4, uh, Republic Commando, or they didn't need it, Half-Life 2, Medal of Honor, Pacific Assault had it, and it really just hurt those games. Freedom Fighters, however, did it best. Sent out to die in the retail wilderness by EA, it's only offspring, the ungrateful, degenerate pairing of Kane and Lynch. Did you ever play Kane and Lynch? No. It was... Uh, <clears throat> I, I think I remember that game. What was that? It was like you're these two uh, like redneck, you know, uh, bank robber jail type guys, and you go around just killing fools. And it's squad command, so you're commanding each other the whole game. Yeah. So that game eventually uh, got made in favor for a sequel to Freedom Fighters. Uh, so it's, Freedom Fighters was a slice of like this alterno history mayhem. It's the tale of New York plumber who becomes a modern resistance hero as Soviet forces hunker down in Brooklyn. It's a scenario well covered before and since, most recently in Modern Warfare 3, but IO's matter-of-fact approach and sincere love of cultural stereotyping still makes Freedom Fighters sing. So you play as Chris, the all-American hero. He's a muscly type who runs around with a wrench, raising stars and stripes over the buildings he liberates with like a tea party zeal. Then, in the red corner, you got the sultry Russian propaganda news lady, who provides somewhat biased commentary on your activities while you run through the game, and that's how a lot of the story is told. So there's also an angry Russian general who's pounding about the streets like a pissed-off Zangief, and the whole time <laughs> you're chasing him down and trying to capture the areas he's held. Um, the game just tells a really good story, and it's got really beautiful music. Um, on one occasion, out of nowhere, your safe zone that's underground, where you keep all your, your partners and everything, it gets discovered, and you go down there to do a run-of-the-mill mission, and you find it all in ruins. Uh, it, all your friends are dead, and it, it's kind of like, it's a really heavy moment in the game, because as you see this destruction and carnage of the people you got to know and care about throughout the game, you kind of realize it's your fault, because you brought them here. You didn't, you chose to not fortify your base and instead go capture more places things like that so it's a really cool uh, heavy moment and an otherwise you know the game doesn't really take itself too seriously the rest of the yeah, time it doesn't sound like it yeah so uh so it's sad then that io interactive the developers uh would go on to instead of doing a freedom fighter sequel they went on to create kane and lynch which underperformed uh they but it was during that that time of just AI squad control. Everyone yeah. was obsessed with it. So they Army just kept the Army of Two. They kept the Kane and Lynch franchise going and it eventually died out. So fans of Freedom Fighters never got to see uh, a proper sequel. Uh, you know, and I'm not immune to the pleasures of Kane and Lynch, but I will say that this drift towards grit, darkness, and endless swearing is, is a shame. Just as it is everywhere in gaming, Freedom Fighters proved that silly shooters could still also have heart, depth, and substance. So if you are into that type of uh, alternative history, you know, rah rah America type, get them ruskies yeah. type of gameplay, Freedom Fighters is really fun. And I touched on this briefly earlier, but the music is awesome. It's all this Stalinistic um, uh, choir chants, and it's really, really well made. So you can find it on GameCube. The game is only about a dollar ninety nine on Amazon right now, um, and I'm sure there's emulators that it exists for as well. So if you're into that, guys, go check out Freedom Fighters on the GameCube. Important question for you. As you know, we only talk about the important stuff, the things that matter here at Crossplay. The things we care about. The things we care about. <laughs> Moving from Freedom Fighters on to Freedom Fries. Who do you think has the best French fries? Uh, just period fast across the kingdom of fast food across, yeah across the king uh, kingdom of fast food you can include non-fast food too if there's a certain restaurant that has particularly good fries i'm gonna i'm gonna go with burger king oh dude burger fucking king wait wait what's better Whoa. what do you what do you think is better that is so off the wall dude that's like among the worst fries call me michael jackson i'm off the wall <laughs> 
That is so false, no, dude. No, because I already know where you're going with this. They're mush. They're mush. They're flavorless. No. Oh, dude. I that that to me. Let me guess. You like worst. McDonald's fries the most? Easily, McDonald's is number one. Why? Let me tell you why. Fuck. Salt. Yeah. They salt the shit out of their fries. Boy, howdy. And it is so good. Right. But the flavor, just the fat that it's fried in, delicious. Correct. So I'll say this about McDonald's. They are kind of hit or miss, meaning it's hard to get a consistent French fry from them. Hell yeah. But if you find a good McDonald's that does it right every time, just go there and you'll get those amazing French fries. Right, I'm taking the mic off here. I'm going to stand up. We're going to figure this out. Turn into the whiteboard. Crossplay whiteboard. We are off the rails here at Crossplay. All right, so let's talk fries. So what matters the most when looking at French fries? You got you got your texture, right? Yep. You got your salt, right? Yep. You got what else? Uh, flavor of the, the potato. Just flavor, just taste, right? Yep. Uh, longevity, that, that matters. Okay. What else? Anything else? Um... I think that's about all. That's, that's what, all I'm factoring in. That's what matters, right? So, texture. BK Lounge has McDonald's beat because mm. they're crunchier. They aren't. They're pasty in them. Their outside's crunchy. The inside is like a paste. It's like a t- potato paste. You know? No, but that's how McDonald's are. On the inside, they're so soft. If you get a good batch of fries. No, they're 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 a little soft, but y- you could tell it's a potato that you're eating. BK okay. is like if they somehow made instant potatoes into a French fry. You're a real son of a bitch. Salt. <laughs> what about salt? Salt. I'll, you know what? I'll give salt to McDonald's. Yeah, they they utilize their salt game. And you could always just ask for salt on the side. If you need more salt in McDonald's fries, you have problems. Well, it, it, again, that comes to the consistency of the McDonald's. Not all of them make them right. So. Right. So, inconsistent fries for McDonald's? <laughs> so, you admit that. As, as for terrible. BK. Okay, flavor and taste. Now, this is where the texture and the salt and all that comes in, in a beautiful combination in Burger King fries. Because they're good after five minutes. Do you know what I mean? You could eat them... After you arrive home from the drive-thru and they're still good. Burger King or McDonald's fries, I feel, by the time you get home, they've already reached past their prime. Not if you close the bag. If you keep the bag closed and make sure there's no like ketchup and shit on top of the thing of fries, you'll get it home and they'll be fine still. Yeah, but see, what you're not considering is the science of this. When you got your fries in there, I'm drawing a picture of fries, everyone. When you got fries in the bag, you got all this steam coming out basically softening the fry area right here does that do you ever experience that the heat from all the food just kind of steaming and softening everything in the bag um i haven't had it soften it because maybe if you leave it in there a long time but when you leave it open all that steam gets out and it dehydrates everything you make a good point all right well let's leave it up to the listeners we're going to put up a twitter poll uh the day this airs and we're going to see what the listeners think who has your favorite fast food French fry? Let us know. Let us know over on Twitter at Crossplay Pod before me and Zach throw down in fisticuffs. <laughs> Last topic of the day cell phones for children. How young is too young? When, when should a kid have a cell phone? Um. Well, I, I mean, I think when they're old enough to use it, when they know what the hell they're doing, you know. Um, you, you don't. You don't worry about the the dangers of the internet and like what a smartphone allows. Not if you put parental controls on it. I mean, it's right. up to the parent. And um, and even still, if if the parent's not supervising their kids on their cell phone use, the problem isn't the cell phone. The problem is the parent. Right. Um, kind of like the you know the old. Marilyn Manson is doing all this to my kids. He's poisoning their minds. Well, don't buy them the CD, parent. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know? someone's buying those CDs. Yeah. I kind of feel like as soon as the kid is at a point where he's away from me, doing his own thing, you know what I mean? When that, he could entertain himself? When he's gone, when he's out with his friends. Like That's when I feel like I kind of need 
to be able to get a hold of him. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, but yeah, the parental control game would have to be on point. Those locks. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, I don't know. And there's so many ways to get around that. Like you gotta eventually just accept, dude. My kid's gonna find porn as early as he fucking wants. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now that the technology's out there. Yep. You know. <clears throat> um. So when when did you have your first cell phone? Um, I think I was maybe 16 or 17. Okay. Do you remember what it was? Uh, it was a weird Verizon phone. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember. It was a flip phone. It was Verizon. It had a camera on it too. It was a, it was a camera phone. That's what oh, yeah. cool. And the camera you could rotate so it, it could go forward for oh, like a I've selfie. Oh, I remember that. Backward. I yeah, remember that phone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I kept funny. that for a long time too. That's funny. Did you ever have a sidekick? Remember those? Uh, Motorola? Was it Motorola? Yeah. No, I never had one of those where you slide up and you can have yeah. a keyboard. I eventually had one. That was like the last phone I had before I got my first smartphone, and it was those were rad. But my very first phone was a old, old Motorola that was just a brick phone. Uh, it had a, you know, a tiny screen on it. It only showed like green shades of green like a Game Boy. It, <laughs> it had Snake on it. Awesome. Um, but the funny thing is I got it as a hand-me-down from my stepmom who got herself like a you know a more updated phone but her guinea pig had ch- uh, chewed off half the numbers on the oh, phone sh- the little rubber numbers yeah so imagine me showing up to school with like a purple ladies phone with half the numbers chewed <laughs> off dude i got clowned on so hard worse than even if i didn't have a cell phone yeah it was that to the point. point where i'd like secretly text like don't show people my phone while i text i didn't want to hear it you know what i mean i have to use the bathroom can you excuse me <laughs> start rattling off a text yeah and then uh do you remember those older nokias that had a uh, um, bowling on them um, it was I, a color. It was a color screen, and they had a bowling game that was really good. No, I remember the old Nokia's, the bulletproof ones. Yeah, the so Kevlar. To speak. The Kevlar. Ones. Yeah, yeah. So back to the topic at hand. So you say as soon as they're able to operate one. So like school age, probably school age. Yeah, my my nephew just started kindergarten, and everyone in the class has an iPad. Like it's given to them from the school, so they all use iPads. And wow. It's <clears throat> it's the standard now, so they expect kids to know how to use a cell phone from a very early age. Yeah, you just kind of brought up an interesting point, because then like, if you don't let your kid have a cell phone, are, is he going to be behind in terms of uh, just how to, how to work a phone and how to be on, on the technical side of, of things? Like, He's going to be behind if you keep him held back. Potentially, yeah. But also, I mean, I never had a phone when I was a kid, and I'm not behind i guess yeah but you weren't in a class where everyone had an ipad and True. a phone probably you know of their own yeah these little kids are gonna be freaking wizards <laughs> all they do is take selfies like eli had like over 100 selfies on his ipad when he first brought it home after his first day that's hilarious <laughs> what does eli do on a phone what does a kid like eli do he's five he's five he <clears throat> he watches java uh guava juice I don't even know what that is. For those that don't know what Guava Juice is, explain it. It's a YouTube channel. It's just some guy that's kind of quirky, off the wall. He's kind of like PewDiePie, but for does, younger kids. Does he sing songs or is he Let's Plays? What does he do? I think sing songs. He probably does Let's Plays too. Most of them do. That's how that's how all these kids find him. Yeah, you know what? I think he does Five Nights at Freddy's Let's Plays. Oh, that would explain. I know Eli loves. He loves Five, five Nights at Freddy's. Well, that's been it for episode 10 of the Crossplay Podcast. It's been a really good episode, Zach. Thank you for being here with me today. Of course. And thank you all for being here with us today. If you like what you hear, you can follow us over on Twitter at Crossplay Pod. You can also check us out over on Patreon and support us there if you'd like at patreon.com slash crossplayentertainment. We will see you next Tuesday for episode 11 of the Crossplay Podcast. We'll see you then. Bye.